2013, a team of researchers from the Norman B. Keevil Institute of Mining Engineering at the University of British Columbia flew to Portobello, Ecuador to evaluate how artisanal miners were using mercury and cyanide to extract gold from ore. The Portobello region has a long history of mining, dating back well over 100 years. The town itself is surrounded by mines and processing facilities. Immediately west of Portobello is El Pache, a processing region containing 88 processing plants, hundreds of mines, and tailings facilities that line the Canada River banks. Artisanal mining can be broken into four components, mining for ore, then crushing it, sorting it, and then refining it into a finished product. Artisanal mining differs from conventional mining in that it uses rudimentary techniques to extract and refine ores. It also employs high degrees of manual labor when conventional power sources aren't available. It's not uncommon for miners to have to carry sacks up from the bottom of the mine weighing over 100 pounds. Some mines have a mix of manual and electric labor, like here, using a winch to lift the, the ore, but then manually removing it from inside of the mine. Typically, artisanal miners will spend one month accumulating 40 tons of ore before venturing to the Alpache processing facilities where they'll bring their ore to be broken down, processed, and refined. Eager to see how much gold is in their ore, they'll work 24 hours a day crushing, processing, sluicing, and panning. In Portobello, the most common method for crushing ore is a Chilean mill, a device with two wheels that turn in a circle, grinding the ore as it rolls over top of it. The ore and water form a slurry that flows through a screen before entering the sluice box. A sluice is an inclined concrete slide. As water flows down, heavier particles deposit on top of the carpets. Miners will alternate between each sluice, turning one sluice off so that they can collect the gold that's resting on each of the carpets. They do this hourly to minimize their losses. Unfortunately, sluices have a very low recovery rate, and almost 70% of the gold is washed into the tailings. After the ore has been crushed and concentrated in a sluice, the miner can process it in a chancha or pan it, concentrating it further. What has been shown here is only an example of how miners can process their ore. Depending on the country, these processes, crushing, sorting, and refining gold, can look very different, but the basic principle is the same. A chancha is a large steel drum containing heavy steel rods or rocks. All the ore is added to several drums along with mercury and sugar. The drums spin for up to eight hours, crushing the ore as well as homogenizing the mercury. This is what is known as a whole ore amalgamation, a process that on average loses 30 to 50 percent of the mercury to the tailings, but losses can be as high as 80 percent. Here, a miner weighs out roughly 300 grams of mercury only to then add the rest of the bottle when I stop filming. Artisanal miners add a broad range of things to the chancha that they believe help the mercury bind to the gold. Many of these things are household items, such as Coca-Cola, bleach, urine, dish soap, toothpaste, and nearly everybody uses brown sugar. No proof has been found that these additives improve mercury's capacity to bind to gold, nor do they reduce the substantial losses of mercury during whole or amalgamations. After processing the ore in a chancha, the slurry is panned to collect the mercury, which is now amalgamated with the gold. Artisanal miners will work for 8 to 10 hours, panning their material, reducing its size tenfold. The remaining 10 to 15 kilograms of concentrate is then further ground with the stone. Grinding the ore further decreases the size of the particles in the ore, as well as increases the chances of mercury forming a bond with the gold. After four to six hours of fine grinding, the gold is ready to be separated from the ore. This is done by filtering and rinsing the ore through a cheesecloth. At this stage, the gold and mercury will form a metallic putty known as an amalgam, which is captured in the cloth if the miner has done his job right. An amalgam is a mixture of gold and mercury that forms a semi-solid structure. Once the amalgam has been cleaned, it is squeezed in a cloth to remove the excess mercury 
creating an amalgam that is nearly 50-50 gold to mercury. This process ensures that the miner, everything they touch, and their workspace is covered in mercury, further contributing to site contamination and increasing the health risk to miners. They take care to squeeze every last drop of mercury, which they collect and reuse. These men didn't believe mercury was expensive, but it lowers their overall costs, so why not? The more mercury there is, the more liquid the amalgam becomes. Miners take advantage of this by adding mercury to the amalgam, making it more malleable and easier to clean. Sugar is added, just as they did in the chancha, because they believe it helps clean the amalgam, increase mercury's capacity to bind to gold, and ultimately, increase their overall yield. The last step in the artisanal miner's process is to separate the gold and the mercury, and this is done through vaporization. The amalgam is loaded into a retort, a device that is intended to capture the toxic mercury vapors and condense them in the water below. Retorts come in a variety of designs, such as this cup and trough system, to larger water-cooled reverse flow systems like this. A miner in Alpache saw the need for more effective retorts and has created a business buying and selling these high-end models. Unfortunately, not everyone's using these more modern retorts. After using the retort properly for 10 minutes, the miner opened the top to check on his gold, releasing the trapped cloud of mercury gas. Impatient, he burns the amalgam in the open air so he can watch the color change as his gold becomes tangible, while releasing the remaining mercury into the air and our lungs. Miners do not respect mercury. It takes too long for them to see the detrimental health effects of their daily exposure. Instead, they choose to gamble with their lives and work in environments with one million times the allowable concentration of mercury in the air. Miners work for over a month amassing enough ore to then spend three days processing it at one of the Portovello plants. At best, they recover 30% of the total gold in their ore. This means that miners who pay the process plant owners to use their plants are leaving behind nearly 70% of the gold they mined. Miners lose the majority of their gold in a sluice. Roughly 70% of it flows over the top of the carpets and down into a tailings facility. Plant owners capitalize on this by keeping the tailings, amassing it for cyanidation later, as well as charging the miners to use the facilities to begin with. Some miners recognize this imbalance and choose to process their own tailings using small batch cyanidation sessions. This allows the miners to capture a majority of their gold. Centers charge extra to rent out cyanidation tanks. Many miners are too impatient to wait the three days it takes to undergo cyanidation, nor do they trust the process owners not to steal their gold at night. Over five days of being agitated in a cyanide solution, the gold is dissolved and pumped through zinc shavings. The zinc precipitates the gold out of solution, turning the zinc from a metallic silver to a dull brown color. The zinc is continually replaced, ensuring that any gold in solution has a maximum chance of binding with it. Similar to the amalgamation process, the zinc is heated and burnt off as well as any mercury that was in the tailings that adhered to the gold, and anything else there that vaporizes over a thousand degrees. This results in huge quantities of heavy metals being spewed into the atmosphere, especially in this situation where that fume hood wasn't actually functioning, as none of the fumes were being sucked up into it. Anyone working near or in these plants is breathing hard concentrations of heavy metals daily. The majority of their molten product is slag, but at the very top is a bar consisting of gold, silver, copper, and a host of other elements. To extract the gold and the silver, and to make as pure bars as possible, the miners melt the bar and pour it into a cauldron of water, and in doing so, they create small ribbons of metal. This maximizes the surface area of the material for processing.
The molten material is now collected from the bottom of the barrel and is boiled in nitric acid for six to seven hours. Thankfully, this is one of the few facilities that have a functioning fume hood, as many miners inhale the nitrogen dioxide fumes that come off the boiling nitric acid. The nitric acid dissolves the silver, turning it blue. Approximately every hour, the nitric acid is poured off and kept later to recover the silver. More nitric acid is added to further dissolve the silver and purify the gold. After six hours of boiling acid, the metallic ribbons have been reduced to a black powder, which is dried with a torch, loaded into a bag, and prepared to be turned into a gold bar. Miners and plant owners often hire a professional at the cost of six to eight hundred dollars to refine the gold in the last stages. Borax is added, which floats on the top of the molten gold. All the impurities at the top were easily removed with the torch as it forces it off the top, like separating oil off the top of water. After several rounds of adding borax and removing the slag from the top, the liquid gold is poured into a crucible where it forms a bar. done properly, there will be no slag attached to the gold, which would look like green glass adhered to the top. As the bar solidifies in the crucible, it's then removed and carried over to a nitric acid bath where it's left to cool. In the end, the miner is left with a $12,000 bar of gold at the spot price. We've reviewed how in Portovello, miners extract their ore, crush it, separate it, isolate the gold, and then where the tailings are taken and processed. But where does the mercury go, and what happens to the cyanide? Nearly all the processing centers in the Portovello region are along the edge of a river. This allows them to use as much water as they need for processing, and a convenient place to put their tailings when they're finished with them. The red dots on these map outline tailings facilities that are at the back of processing centers. All but a few of these tailings facilities are small dugouts, some of them lined, and many only meters from the river's edge. In the majority of the processing centers, the equipment that processes gold gets the most attention. The equipment that processes the tailings is in disrepair and grossly undersized to deal with the quantity of tailings that actually need to store. It's very common to see tailings where they can escape from the left here through this one meter thick wall and into the river. Or in other situations where it rains, everything floods, and flows into the river. This has created an international crisis between Ecuador and Peru, where cyanide and mercury are flowing down the Payangu River into Peru and out through Tumbas into the Pacific. This map shows concentrations of mercury in the river sediment in milligrams per kilogram. You can see here that mercury is flowing from Portovello down along the river and up towards Tumbos in the far left. This map shows concentrations of arsenic in the river sediment. Naturally occurring arsenic in the ground is concentrated during the mining and refining phases. It's then allowed to escape into the environment when the tailings leaks from the ponds into the river. This has terrible consequences for anyone living downstream as arsenic is highly poisonous. Mercury, cyanide, arsenic, as well as a host of other heavy metals are transported down the river where they can build up in agriculture, aquaculture, and salt flats, all of which are highlighted here in green along the river and coastline between Tumbas, Peru, and Manchala, Ecuador. Peru has threatened legal action against Ecuador if they do not prevent the destruction of the Payangu River system from artisanal miners dumping tailings filled with cyanide and mercury. The Ecuadorian government has come up with two solutions. The first is creating a large communal tailings facility, 
Pipelines would carry the existing tailings from the current processing plants to the base of a new plant where they would be refined and then stored safely, preventing their release into the river. The tailings facility, known as El Tablon, has been under construction since the year 2000. While construction on the pipeline finishes, trucks currently carry tailings from the processing plants to be dumped in the facility. This is one step forward in reducing the 6 tons of cyanide and 1 ton of mercury that ends up in the river every year from tailings disposal. Ecuador's second solution to reducing the pollution in the river systems is making the use of mercury illegal. Doing so would make criminals out of thousands of Porto Vela residents as well as force them out of the processing centers where they have access to retorts, instead burning amalgamations at their home where their children and families could be at risk. Artisanal gold mining is a poverty-driven activity that nearly 15 million people rely on to make a living and provide for their families. Many artisanal miners are proud entrepreneurs or people who have no other alternative. Dealing with the economic and social problems around the world that drive artisanal mining is important, but will take decades. Today we need to focus on educating miners on how to process gold to improve their yields and how to do so without mercury. Investing in mercury-free technologies that are culturally and technologically appropriate for AGM will go a long way to reducing the quantity of mercury that is released into the environment. To do this, we will need people who can transfer their knowledge and build capacity in AGM communities. We will need capital to buy equipment, land, and fund training centers, as well as policy structures that are relevant to the people they empower, from municipal organizations to international.